Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Brittany Schmidt. Hey, everybody. Happy Valentine's Day. Uh, thanks for spending it with me and Europa. Um, I spend a lot of my time with Europa, too, so it's nice to spend this night here together. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we're trying to do for the future exploration of Europa and what we're doing here in our own backyard. Um, but before I get uh, started with that, I just have a question for everyone. How many uh, people believe in aliens? <laughs> Me too. In this case, I'm not actually talking about the kind that we, uh, some people believe we've talked to. Um, but in fact, even the ones living in our own uh, backyard. So for those of us who are planetary scientists, this is the kind of image we'd really love to send back someday, right? Uh, robots under the ice at Europa, um, finding something like that. So that's a crinoid, actually, and that's a, a, an image that we took, or a video that we took, um, with a vehicle I'm going to describe in the later half of the talk, just this season in Antarctica. But it's the type of thing that we'd love to imagine doing. Um, and I think it's kind of interesting to set the stage that way, too, because um, there were some other people that were thinking about uh, life and the universe and, and how things worked um, somewhat longer ago. So if you were to uh, take an image with a normal telescope or a very small telescope, uh, probably four inches would get you a telescope picture like this, um, you'd be seeing very similar to what Galileo saw um, through his very first telescope. So when he built the first telescope, it was basically like half a binocular. Um, but luckily, not so much light pollution at the time, so it was pretty easy to go and see uh, the moons actually moving around Jupiter. Um, so if we zoom in to the way that we see uh, the planetary system um, of Jupiter, uh, we've got Jupiter here. This is imagery from the Galileo spacecraft, and we've got uh, the family of moons. Io is the most volcanically active place in the solar system, including the Earth, so actually more activity than the Earth. Europa is going to be the star of the show, so we'll leave it alone for a moment. Um, Ganymede is actually the largest moon in the solar system, actually bigger than the planet Mercury. Um, and Callisto is the outermost icy moon, and it's interesting because it actually hasn't done as much interesting geology as the rest of the, as the, rest of the system. And so the Galileo spacecraft um, observed the Jupiter system this way in the late 90s and early 2000s. And most of what we know about the Jupiter system comes from that. But this is the star of our show. This is Europa. Uh, Europa is, a, is the innermost icy moon uh, of Jupiter's, and it's about the same size as the Earth's moon. Uh, the difference, of course, being that on the outside of this planet, there is about 100 to 150 kilometers of water and ice. So this is the, my favorite picture of Europa from the Galileo uh, days. Um, and what kind of jumps out at you to begin with? What do you notice? Yeah, you notice these big red cracks. What do you not notice? No craters. No craters. Why is that important? Yeah, it, it means it's young. It's resurfacing. It's doing something interesting. And so as a planet, we can tell just from the surface of Europa that it's someplace special. And it's unlike anywhere else in the solar system except maybe the Earth in terms of the age of its surface. So it's been geologically active potentially over the entire history of the solar system. And we know that just from these pictures. But how we understand the rest of the system is also very important. So we talk a lot about a term that, I, that we call habitability, which is essentially just a way of thinking about what are the ingredients that a planet would need in order to host life in general. And there's a whole series of those things. But it turns out, if you think about it, you have to do more than put a bunch of ingredients uh, you know, into a bowl in order to make a cake, right? So there's a whole lot that you have to work out. And so when we're thinking about Europa, we're also trying to really think about how the pieces that we have and the data that we have, how it all fits together, and how that might tell us about whether or not Europa could, could host life. Turns out the orbit is one of the really special things about it. So we said Europa's got a young surface, it's constantly resurfacing. The reason that that's happening is actually because it's in a very special orbital dance with Ganymede and Io. 
what happens is that basically as they orbit Europe, or as they orbit Jupiter, they're pulled just slightly out of a circular orbit, which means that they're always on a slightly eccentric orbit and they're always getting energy from tides. So if you think about the tides on the Earth, a um, few meters, at Europa, it could be up to 30 meter uh, vertical tide just from being distorted by Jupiter. So they're in close next to Jupiter, and what that means is, is that as Europa travels around, it's actually being compressed and extended over the course of its orbit. And so what this actually does is to heat up the ice shell and heat up potentially the interior as well. So the battery that's been powering all of that geologic activity actually comes from its orbit. On the Earth, that's, that's being powered from radiogenic nuclides, from extra energy left over from when the Earth formed. Europa has some of that, but not nearly as much as the Earth because it's so much smaller. So unlike uh, our moon, which is basically or mostly geologically dead now, Europa got into this dance with Io and Ganymede and it's kept it active over the lifetime of the solar system. And that's why the surface looks like this. That's why we don't see craters, that's why we see cracks all over the surface, and we see disruptions. And so each of these geologic processes is telling us a little bit of the story of how Europa works. And it turns out that that's going to be important for understanding, uh, for understanding the whole system. So those red marks on there, those are things that we call very scientifically non-ice materials. Um, <laughs> because we don't have a great agreement on the exact composition of those materials. We do know that it's salts, right? It's magnesium, sodium, uh, um, and chlorine-bearing salts kind of distributed across the surface. We know that things on Europa that are red are young and that are white are old. Um, and then we know that there are different types of fractures in geology all over the place. So we're going to take a look at what each of those systems looks like. So at every resolution that you look at Europa, it looks like a yarn ball, right? So you've seen yarn every which direction, except in this case, it's tectonic fractures. So they're at every single resolution. So here we have some of what are called uh, Europa's cycles. That's not good. Um, so th these arcuate um, cusps there are called cycloids, and we think that they have something to do with those changing tides on Europa's surface. So they have these kind of cusp structures, and we don't see them anywhere else in the solar system, really. But then we have lots and lots of linear fractures, and they happen at all kinds of resolutions. So this is a very close-in image, right, two kilometers, um, in which we'd be able to pretty much see this building or come very close. And we can still see these fractures on top of fractures on top of fractures. So it's a very complicated geologic history to understand. Something else kind of neat about Europa is that it looks like its surface has been actively changing in other ways. So right now, this is what the image looks like. And if you cut the middle out, you can actually stitch the geology on either side, or the isology, if you want to call it that, um, back together on either sides of this feature that we call a band. And so these bands, we think, might operate a little bit like a system that we have here on Earth. Anyone knows what system I'm talking about? Okay. Yeah, seafloor spreading, right? Specifically mid-ocean mid ridges, right? So at mid-ocean ridges in, on the Earth, you've got active kind of resurfacing happening. The plates pull apart and new material is built. So we think we have here is evidence that Europa's ice shell is actually doing that very same thing, pulling apart. So there's all kinds of places on the surface where you can actually kind of puzzle piece it back together um, based on its geologic history. There's a certain class of features that we also don't really see anywhere else in the solar system, and we call them chaos terrains. Um, there's all kinds of things that fall into this category. Uh, these are Europa's freckles, um, or lenticulae, and they are just things that we call pits, spots, and domes because there's pits, there's spots, and there are domes. Um, and these are relatively small disruptions that happen in clusters all over the surface. Um, but they can happen on scales of, uh, in this case, five kilometers. So most of the things that you're seeing in those kind of reddish spots and domes here are between uh, five and ten kilometers wide. But features that like this, that are disruptions, are large chaos, and they can be up to 100 kilometers in size. So these are really huge features. And these are places where something from the inside of Europa, somehow, some process, is actually disrupting the surface. Um, so the surface is being interrupted, that ice is being broken up um, by processes coming from the inside. And so this is one of the places that we really want to understand because it's 
a little bit like the way the Earth does things, right? You've got places where there's plates moving around and you've got stuff coming up from the inside and resurfacing the planet as well. We mentioned it a little bit with the, uh, with the seafloor spreading, but on Earth, right, every time we, we know we've got seafloor spreading, there's a place on the planet where, the, where another plate is actually being subducted, right, is being driven down um, underneath uh, uh, another plate. And so for the very first time, uh, this is recent work by Simon Cattenhorn um, and Louise Proctor, showing that there's in fact areas of Europa's surface that have just gone completely missing. And so on the left-hand side is the geology that we see today. So those colors are the different features. So they've, they've colored this band blue and another band red, um, another one green. And if you take the whole thing and kind of slide the surface back together until those features add up, you're left with a huge chunk of space that's missing, so a huge chunk of the ice shell. And what we think that's telling us is that this is the other part of the plate tectonic system. So we've got bands where we're expanding. We've got material coming up from the inside. And then finally, we think we've got some type of plate tectonic motion where we've actually got subduction, or in this case, what we've been calling subsumption, where the ice shell is actually a little bit destroyed by this process. This is important because it actually might transport material from the surface down into the deeper interior the same way that plate tectonics does that on the Earth. It's a little bit different system, of course, um, but that makes it a really interesting place. So why do we think about Europa? Well, it's all this new geology. There's an ocean. We're very excited about all of that. But it's also because it's a place that we might hope to understand. So if we think about planets in the solar system that we're pretty familiar with, we've got our home, the Earth, Mars, and Europa. I'm going to argue that Europa is very Earth-like in this context. And it's because, much like the Earth, for the last four and a half billion years, Europa's had an ocean. And that ocean is in contact with its silicate interior. So you notice this is kind of a cutaway. So it's showing what the Earth's core looks like in the surface ocean. And then we've got Mars um, with its core and, and silicate surface. And then Europa with an ice shell overlaying an ocean, overlaying a silicate interior. Why that's important is that on Earth we know that the interaction of water and rock has been a major player in metabolism, in biology, potentially in the origins of life here on this planet. And so on Europa, the fact that we've got an ocean directly in contact with that active or potentially active interior is very, very important. And even if Europa isn't active today the way it was perhaps four and a half billion years ago, it probably was active much like the Earth in a very similar way at one point in time in its history. And so it's a really compelling place to look. It's true of Mars as well, right? We think that Mars probably had surface oceans about three billion years ago. But now we're thinking about more of a fossilized place. And so in these, these are a little bit different in terms of why you would explore each place. But that's really why I like to think about Europa as kind of our most Earth-like um, uh, Earth -like companion. And why do we care about all of these things? So I've kind of given you a little bit. But it's really, how do you power a biology? How do you power life? What do you do as a planet in order to support life? And does any place aside from the Earth in our own solar system actually have that energy? And so when we talk about planets, we're really talking about trying to understand the entire system. And on Europa, it's still going on. How does this geology tell us about what the planet is like? And more than just life at the seafloor, um, we also know that there are places on Europa that would be really good places for terrestrial life, or at least potentially, right? Ice is actually a great place to live, not necessarily for you or I, um, but for microorganisms. So these are um, actual images from uh, colleagues of mine at Montana State University, and what they show um, is actual um, brine inclusions inside of ice where microbes are living very happily. Um, so sea ice, glacier ice, every type of ice that we find here on Earth has microorganisms that are just absolutely happy to live there. So the whole ice shell on Europa, if it, say, had an origin of life four and a half billion years ago, could be interesting um, in terms of habitats for life that we imagine on the Earth, or that we know is on the Earth. Um, and then the question about the seafloor, I think, is the most relevant. And it was relevant early in its history and is potentially very important even today. Um, so on Earth, uh, black smokers and white smokers um, are our chemical sources of energy for an amazing complexity of life, right? So the seafloor um, is just teeming with life that doesn't necessarily depend on the surface environment. 
And this may be a place that um, life began here on Earth. And so we're really interested in understanding whether this is possible for Europa. So the way we like to think about it is a little bit like a geologic battery. When we think about the geology and the surface processes on a planet, is that that's kind of a way of thinking about the planet as an energy source. Is it moving things from the surface down into the subsurface? For Europa, another really cool thing about it is that the surface, even though it's got this geology that's much like our surface, the surface you can also think about is almost like its atmosphere. So it doesn't actually have a real atmosphere, but the interaction of radiation um, with Europa's surface produces hydrogen peroxide on the surface. So free oxygen is sitting there potentially on the surface of Europa. So why I get excited about plate tectonics and the ability to crunch up ice and bring it down into the interior is because it could be supplying things like oxygen or oxidants to an otherwise reduced ocean, to an ocean that's been reacting with rocks. So when you put those two things together, you have basically a geologic battery that's similar to the way that a lot of things make a living here on Earth. And so that's kind of the story, is how do we think about the planet um, in terms of the elements that may or may not connect? So that's kind of how Europa is very Earth-like. But now I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we use the Earth to study Europa, um, in a, both for its geology um, and what we're trying to do for future exploration. So this is one of my favorite types of features on the surface. I mentioned this is a chaos terrain. Um, and this is probably the most famous picture of Europa's surface. Um, what do you notice about it? What do you think you're seeing? Broken, it's kind of, uh, you can see the old geology, right? You can see cracks kind of going across it, but then it's kind of mix, mixed up, right? So this is a region called Connemara Chaos. And when we saw it in Galileo, people thought, oh my gosh, Europa's surface is melted, and those are icebergs floating around, and the ocean is coming up to the surface. And that's a good first order idea, except it's probably not what's happening. First reason for that is the surface temperature of Europa is about 100 Kelvin. So that's, what, minus 200 and, what is it, 50 almost. Um, so pretty cold place. Um, so in terms of getting enough heat to actually melt liquid water at 100 Kelvin uh, surface temperature, that might not work out so well. So how can we learn about it? It does still look like icebergs, right? Well, it turns out that icebergs don't form by melting. They form by another process. And so we can actually take observations of Europa and observations of the Earth and put them together and learn about how those processes work. So when I look at a picture like this, we just did this exercise, right? I see fractures. We see icebergs. We see big cliffs. The cliffs turn out to be an important part of the story. We see dark material that's actually in between the icebergs, right, and this kind of irregular stuff that we call matrix. Um, it turns out that there's also topography in that, right? So if you imagine icebergs floating in the ocean and ice in, uh, crunched up ice in between it, right, that material would be lower, right, than the icebergs, right? The ice is, is less dense, so it floats up high, right? Kindergarten physics. On Europa, it looks like that kind of up close, but in between, they, we get these big domes, which is kind of interesting. So we have to be able to explain that as well in this matrix material. Well, it turns out if we look at Antarctica, this is uh, the collapse of an ice shelf called Larsen B. It happened uh, in the early 2000s. It was one of the first events that we actually got to image with spacecraft. And what you're seeing here, um, when you just see the, um, the solid ice, sh ice shelf, Right there, all those little blue lines are just a little bit of water that's collected inside surface fractures. And when it kind of explodes the ice shelf, what happens is that a little bit of water got inside the fracture and exerted a lot of force and was able to kind of explode the ice that way. So a very tiny amount of water and a whole lot of force. The other thing that you notice is if you zoom in, in between these big icebergs, you see crunched up material. Right? So we have the same kind of observation here that we do on Europa. These are different scales, different, different process, and different number of fractures. But the basic observations of those cliffs on the side of the ice and the crunched up material in, be in between the icebergs is the same. And so that turns out to be also important for the story, is for understanding this. And so what we did is to put this together um, into a story about how Europa's geology forms, and in this case, chaos terrain. And so what we think is happening is that um, there's warming happening either inside the ice shell or from the ocean below, causing a big melt pocket to form in the middle of the ice. Um, when that happens, that kind of crunches the surface up, allows the ice to break up, 
all those icebergs rattle around and crunch up the material in between. And then when it freezes back out, some of the water gets into the crunched up material and it describes why we see these domes. So when we put together a couple of observations of the Earth and a couple of observations of Europa and a little bit of what we know from basic physics, we can figure out what happened on this planet using just those, um, those surface images. And it tells us something really cool about the interior, right? That it's active and that there's this almost volcanic-like process um, taking over the surface of Europa. So that's a geologic example. Um, and I'm going to give you some more examples here in a moment. But I wanted to just talk briefly about what our plans are right now for getting to Europa. Um, another way that we've learned about the Earth, and particularly about Antarctica, um, is to use what's called ice-penetrating radar. And so ice penetrating radar um, allows us to actually kind of take almost an x-ray of the ice. Um, so this radar can go through and see layers. It's how we reconstruct climate history across from ice core to ice core to ice core. Um, all of these lines that you see are annual accumulation of snow. Um, so the aerosols and the dust that's in the atmosphere gets collapsed in between uh, snowflakes, compressed down into layers. And so we can track those across. Um, what you're seeing up at the top is South Pole Station. That's reflections of that, um, off of that. And at the bottom, you can see this lake that's under the South Pole. And so this is um, data that was taken um, by the University of Texas in the late 90s using their, their early um, radar system. But there's been a whole bunch of work done. Um, so these ice penetrating radar systems have allowed us to see inside the ice on Earth. And so we're actually going back to Europa um, with a mission called Europa Clipper. Um, and that is going to have 11 science instruments, but among them um, is this ice penetrating radar technique that was perfected first here on the Earth in the polar regions. Um, so one of the cool things about it, if you thought, think about the geologic story I just told you, water pockets in the ice, um, layers and fractures and things, those are all things we can imagine being able to image with one of these radar systems. So um, we're pretty excited about that. But we'll also have cameras, um, magnetometers, spectrometers. Uh, it's very similar to Cassini in a lot of ways. If you've been following the Cassini mission, it'll actually be able to sniff the ice and particles that are coming off the surface. If, we, if there are plumes on Europa, which we think there, there may be, we could be able to fly through them and get some samples of the subsurface materials. Um, the plan for this is to launch in around 2022. Um, always depends on launch vehicles and, and uh, NASA um, itself, but i um, pretty excited about this particular mission um, to go back. And then what we'd like to be able to do after that is send a lander. So uh, there have been two lander concepts actually um, done, uh, full up done by, by NASA at this point. Um, this is from the most recent one that completed in 2016 um, and was reported on in 2017. And so the idea for this kind of a platform is to, to land on the surface and to take a sample of the ice or a few samples of the ice um, and be able to ingest that and really look at that chemistry, right? Really understand what's in the ice and understand um, uh, the processes that have happened to it. So it'll have cameras, it'll have a chemical suite uh, on the inside. It'll also have a seismometer, so it actually can listen to Europa quakes. It turns out that huge tidal amplitude is also going to be really good for creating ice quakes and things that we'll be able to use to image the interior of Europa that way. So this is just one concept, but this is all kind of coming by. Um, in Clipper's case, we'll be orbiting Jupiter and flying by Europa um, tens and tens of times. So right now, 42 in the prime mission. And that allows us to build up surface coverage. Um, way to think about it is that uh, on Mars, we can see most of Mars, we would be able to see this podium. Right, we'd definitely be able to see the room that we're sitting in today. Uh, on Europa, we have 10% of the surface covered in what we call high-resolution imaging. And high-resolution to a European is 300 meters per pixel. So we would miss this auditorium and probably most of, uh, most of the coastline of California in some of these images. And so trying to figure out a place like that um, without more information is, is somewhat difficult. Um, but what I'm going to tell you about now is we never stop just there, right? So uh, planetary missions take tens of years to plan, and tens of years to get through the NASA funding process and to um, finally launch. So you can't ever wait until the data is coming back from, from the first one 
um, to start planning for the next one. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is to understand how to get into Europa and how to study it that way. And that's kind of where this kind of Earth coming, or uh, Europa in our backyard story kind of begins. Um, so um, I'm uh, the PI of a project called Rise Up, um, which is uh, Ross Ice Shelf and Europa Underwater Probe. And it's a really cool grant program that NASA funds. So they have a, a thing called Planetary Science and Technology for Analog Research. And they basically fund people to do work on Earth with modern technologies, with new technologies that we might one day be able to send to space. And in our case, it's underwater vehicles. And so NASA is funding us to go to Antarctica to learn more things about the Earth and in the same time teach ourselves about Europa. So this is the best idea we have about how Europa's ocean works and it's based on a computer model um, that a friend of mine and I ran. Um, and so how do we think about actually measuring the properties of an ocean that we haven't seen yet? And so that's kind of the story for, for this. And how does that interact with the ice, um, the ice above it? So what we've built um, at Georgia Tech in my group is called Icefin. Um, and so uh, it seems like all of the underwater vehicles are called Bluefin or Yellowfin or something like that. So we've got an Icefin here. Um, and what we've done is to design a vehicle that's of the same size class that you might eventually launch, right? There's lots and lots of really big AUVs, um, autonomous underwater vehicles, right? But they're not the types of things you can put inside uh, a spacecraft and launch to the surface of Europa. So Icefin is about 12 feet long, um, and it comes apart into individual modules, which I'll describe here in a moment. And it's the same kind of thing that we might be able to send. But the other thing that's important about it is it's something that we can take to multiple places in Antarctica. So Antarctica is similarly hard to get to, not quite as hard as Europa, um, but still not so easy. And so anything we can do to make logistics smaller and require less fuel and require uh, fewer people, the more exploration we can do. And so that's what we've designed this vehicle to do. Some of the neat things about it is that we have sensor bays that we can point up or down so that we can do ice missions and do seafloor missions. Um, we can swap out sensor bays with new science, inf science uh, instruments if we want to do a different type of mission. Um, presently, we have about a three and a half kilometer range and that's limited by the tether. So we have it tethered because we deploy this thing through holes in the ice and if you're a relatively early career professor at a university, you don't want to lose your entire project uh, through a hole that's this big in the ice. So the tether allows us to actually communicate with the vehicle, but also to retrieve it through the ice as well. Um, and it's rated to 1,500 meters. So we can actually get all the way to the seafloor everywhere um, in the Ross Ice Shelf region, which is where we've been working. Um, so these are kind of some zoom-ins uh, of the vehicle design. So up front, um, we've got uh, kind of our sensing module, or one of our sensing modules. The very front is a forward-looking sonar. Then we've got cameras, a dissolved oxygen sensor, and a CTD. CTD stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth. So it's basically first-order water chemistry. So we're getting how much oxygen is in the water and how much salt is in the water um, from this front bay. And then we're getting images of the environment as well. Right behind that is a thruster bay. So that allows us actually, there's two sets of, thr of, of directional thrusters. It allows us to translate sideways or to turn in the water column and kind of tilt as well. Um, following that is the, is the main science bay. And in there we have suites of instruments. So we either go oceanography mode where we have um, our cameras and our side scan sonar, or we go kind of biological and chemical oceanography mode um, where we have inside of it um, a uh, dissolved oxygen, or sorry, dissolved organic matter sensor, um, a sensor for turbidity, kind of tells us about the particulates in the water column, um, and a pH or an ORP, so um, water pH and the uh, reduction potential. Essentially, if we swam over the top of a hydrothermal vent, we would hopefully know it based on that sensor. Um, after that, the black bay there is where all the electronics are housed. Um, so we build all of that in-house. In, uh, in we have um, a combination of um, all kinds of chips and, and small computers that we use um, and kind of integrate that in the lab as well. Um, after that is our navigation model, our um, module where we can actually kind of tell the direction and, and rate at which we're traveling. And that's how we figure out how to navigate underneath the ice. And then after that is another uh, another directional center, uh, thruster bay and our rear thruster. 
So that's how we get around under the ice. Um, and so it's basically trying to solve a whole lot of problems at once. How are we going to get to Europa and swim around inside of there? Um, can we launch a vehicle that is relatively small? But if we're going to go all the way to Europa, we need all kinds of sensors, right? And at the same time, we're going to Antarctica, a hard place to get to, lots of unknowns. And so can we take as many instruments as possible with us? And which ones are the best in those environments for studying the ice and the ocean? Um, the other way to think about it is that we need to practice this here on Earth because um, we were driving cars on Earth for 100 years before we sent one to Mars, right? So if it's not routine to use an AUV in Antarctica, it's not going to be routine to use an AUV when we get to Europa either. So this is kind of the, the idea here by making this more possible um, and trying to do more. So smaller, field portable, and uh, launchable types of instruments. So what do we actually do for the Earth? Well, it turns out we can also learn a lot about this while we're designing this vehicle. Because planetary scientists think about, um, think about spacecraft, we think about miniaturizing things and trying to get as much, as much bang for your buck as possible, right? We have to launch very small packages. So that's what we've done with IceFin. But we can also get into these environments in a different way than has been done with other technologies. Um, so this is the marine ice shelf system. So an ice shelf is essentially a system of glaciers. So glaciers are streaming, um, streaming down the continent, they hit the water, and then they stitch together into a sheet. Um, the only really large ice, she ice shelves that we have left are in Antarctica. The Arctic had them, but they've collapsed in the last 100 years. So Antarctica is really the place that we have left to study these. We go to the Ross Ice Shelf because it's one of the biggest, um, and so there's a lot, uh, a lot left to learn about that system. So as they flow across uh, over the ocean, it then starts to interact with the ocean itself. And so there's processes by which um, the ocean can kind of undercut um, the ice sheet, um, and that process is important to understand, especially as ocean temperature changes. And so as this melt process happens, we also have a way of forming new ice. And so the process of melting some of the ice and reforming some of it and then losing part of that system can all be measured using the sensors that I just described on IceFin. And so we're trying to take the robot and actually be able to solve some earth science problems as well. So unfortunately, um, we were supposed to be able to go through the ice shelf at this position this last season, and we're prevented by a 500 mile wide um, fog bank um, that sat over the Ross Ice Shelf for, uh, for two entire weeks. So we didn't actually make it out to this point, but our colleagues did and took in situ measurements. And then next season, um, we'll be going out to the very back of the ice shelf and trying to map the grounding line for the very first time. The grounding line is the place where the glacier goes afloat, where it leaves the continent and starts to enter the ocean. And so that is a, an area that's incredibly dynamic and has never really been imaged um, or mapped. Um, a few uh, projects have gotten to there, um, but with relatively minimal instrumentation. So we're very excited to work, work with this project. And um, this is also a collaboration with um, the New Zealand program. So the New Zealand program are actually drilling holes um, in the ice shelf. The reason that this is hard to do is that the Ross Ice Shelf is actually about the size of France, and we have only drilled through it in two places. So the size of France, we have two measurements. So this is going to double the amount of science that we've done since 1977. Um, so it's kind of amazing to think about. And then the dimensions here is that that ice shelf, um, uh, where we drilled this season, was, was about 350 meters thick. And where we're going next season is, all, is uh, about 800. So 800 meters of ice is pretty terrifying also to, just, to drop your vehicle down through. Um, very, very high-tech graphics there for you guys. There you go. Um, so what does that look like? So this is a, a, um, a Google Earth image of um, what I consider to be my hometown at this point in time. Um, this is McMurdo. Um, so this uh, area right down here at the bottom with the red circles, um, that's the sea ice out in, front, uh, out in front of McMurdo. And I'm not supposed to walk over here, but I will anyway. Um, there's a ring that's very faint. You can see it right here. That's the contact between the sea ice, which is an annual phenomenon, forms every year and breaks up every year, and the ice shelf. And the ice shelf is relatively permanent. So that's the, the glaciers that are flowing off, becoming a, a sheet and kind of stretching out. 
And so we go and basically park ourselves as close to the ice shelf as we can in this environment and then drive the robot out underneath the shelf. Um, so that's a peninsula that we live on, the kind of where the plane logo is right there. That's McMurdo Station. Um, so that's where we live when we're there. And just up in this picture, um, just off screen, is Erebus Volcano. It's an active volcano that's kind of looming over us. It's really, really beautiful. Um, another thing I'll talk about here um, is Erebus Glacier Tongue, where some of those uh, additional circles are there. Um, so that's one of the areas that we're studying as kind of an analog for what we're going to do at the end of the season this year and mapping a grounding line. Um, so that's a glacier that's actually flowing off of the Ross, uh, the Ross Island, and it gives us a place to kind of test some of our technology there. So this is kind of a map of the whole system. So the, this little image here all is pretty much um, that tiny blue area down in the lower right. So this is the scale of the whole system. So we've got a drill site that happened um, this last season, which we didn't get to explore with the robot, but lots of great science was done there. Um, the, the thing that says RISP J9 borehole, that is the first hole that was drilled in 1977. Um, and then um, where it says HWD1 is where we're going to be putting in um, our hole this, this season. So we're going to go back to McMurdo and do the science I'm just going to describe now. Um, but then we're going to spend the rest of our season out trying to map the grounding line um, of the CAM ice stream. So I'm one person giving a talk, but it takes a huge number of people to accomplish a, pro a project like this. What's pretty neat about it here is that most of the people on this list are current or former students of mine. So I'm 35, and I'm the oldest person on the project. <laughs> so it's pretty cool, because hopefully some of us slash them will still be around when we send one of these to Europa. Um, but it's also really a cool um, story about capable people trying to get together and do something pretty hard. And so um, it's been a wonderful experience. So you can notice that we've got undergrads, we've got high school interns, we have masters and PhD students, and former undergrads, masters and PhD students all involved. Um, so it's lots of fun. And the official investigators are all women. Uh, myself, uh, Amanda Stockton, and Jennifer Glass were all professors at Georgia Tech. So when I decided I wanted to build IceFin, we wanted our, our favorite biologist, Dr. Jen Glass, to be in, on our team. And Amanda Stockton's group builds chemical instruments. So we're going we're gonna to have a, a new instrument there, too. Um, so lots and lots of people working on the team. So this is uh, what it looks like at Erebus Glacier Tongue. So this is our team photo. Um, very inspired, uh, as you can tell. And so what we're doing here is we're actually standing on the sea ice, and you can see the glacier tongue in the back, and that kind of slope up there is Mount Erebus, uh, the volcano. Um, but if you know my group of characters, um, this is a much more accurate representation <laughs> of what we're like uh, in the field and, and otherwise. So um, great group uh, to work with. Um, I wanted to show you a few more pictures of what our life is like down in Antarctica. So this is actually our uh, charcuterie board that we opened up on our way down to McMurdo Station. So we're, this is inside a C-17, so a military aircraft where we're like in bucket seats along the side. And, and my uh, team decided to bring a charcuterie board to make sure we, made, we met everyone on the plane. Um, so it was pretty great. Um, this is a, a picture of our friend uh, Mel Sands, um, who's the ice driller. Um, so that he's about to put a huge hole. You can kind of see the hole being drilled down at the bottom. Um, it's a four-foot hole um, that um, will park a thing called a fish hut on top of it, and then we'll be able to access the ice underneath. And so there's about three or so meters of ice that we're standing on at that point. So um, tractors and all kinds of things uh, get involved. Um, this is the team. So this is uh, Dan and Matt working on the electronics bay, actually inside uh, one, of the, um, one of the laboratories in, at McMurdo Station. Um, all that pink stuff is ESD safe material. Dan would be proud of me for, for telling you about that so that we don't zap any of the electronics. Um, so we had a very ri uh, rigid protocol in our like makeshift lab down at the bottom uh, of the Crary lab. Um, this is us trying to pack everything we own into basically a snowcat. Um, so in order to drive all the stuff out across the ice to the site that we're working on, um, this is how well packed we had, exactly no space. Um, usually maybe space for one person to sit in the back, get vibrated to death trying to hold the stuff from shaking. So um, robots aren't expendable, but people are. No, not quite. That's just kidding. Safety first. Um, so there's another picture of someone crammed in the back of a piston bully. They're called piston bullies. Um, they really are kind of like snow cats um, with all of our gear. 
Um, so yeah, so that's, uh, sorry, that's, uh, oh, this is actually one of our friends bailing us out. Um, and then there's Chad and Dan uh, in that picture there. Um, so that hole that I showed you being drilled, so this is what it looks like from inside the fish hut. This is us dangling ice fin um, over the hole, um, getting it ready to go down through the ice um, with the team kind of, uh, kind of assisting. Um, and this is what the base station looks like. So we've got, we black out all the windows and we all sit in the dark and uh, we were operating mostly in ROV mode, so remote operated mode this year. And so Chad's actually sitting there um, with an Xbox controller or a PlayStation controller. They're gonna be mad at me. I forget which one we actually went with. Um, and actually controlling the robot. And I'm sitting behind him telling him kind of what to do. And so we're having science conversations and engineering conversations. Uh, you can see Dan's right there pointing at the screen, so they're kind of keeping an eye on all of our sensors that are on board the vehicle at the same time. So it's, it's our uh, mission operations. Um, and there's ice fin going down into the hole. Um, this is because our friends are amazing and made us uh, pasties one day, so you can actually see us um, warming things on the heater. Pretty great experience and driving the robot along. So all that, those pictures up there are live feed from the robot under the ice um, that we're getting back through there. Um, and more pretty pictures of putting robots through the ice. So this is what it looks like from under the ice. So this is ice fin operating. Um, we, we like to call this the demon ice fin mo uh, movie. So friends of ours um, at the University of Oregon have an underwater observatory. Um, and they took this video of IceFin as we were doing some buoyancy testing. So you can see those two lights there are its laser scales. So we can actually, as we're imaging things, we've got laser pointers kind of looking at it so we know how far apart they are. We can basically measure things inside, um, inside the field of view. That background there is a crack in the sea ice. All the green stuff is algae living in the sea ice. Uh, and this is just outside of McMurdo. So that's about two meters or so of ice above us. Um, you gotta get some thruster sounds in there. Um, this is another view of Icefin kind of swimming around underneath the ice shelf, or uh, sorry, this is a much thicker sea ice. So you can already see how much less light there was in this environment. Um, so the, light, the ice doesn't let much light through and the ice shelf lets no light through. So this is now under the McMurdo ice shelf. So this is kind of um, just actually in December, December 5th uh, of this year. Uh, or this last year. And so these are white, these white fish are called borks and they're, um, they love to hang out actually inside the ice. Um, and remember when I was telling you about this melt and refreeze process, well all those big crystals that you're seeing right there, those are new crystals of ice. They're called platelets um, and they become a layer of marine ice that's formed out of the ocean. And so it's an interaction of cold melt water um, and the surface of the ice forming this new layer of ice underneath it. So this is the kind of view that's pretty much been impossible until now to get. And so um, we can also take and not just use the remote sensing in the vehicle, but we can also look and map all of its sensor data. So this is a dive down to the seafloor where it is 530 meters. And what we've done here is to color that data um, by the temperature. So the temperature structure is one of the ways that we can tell what's happening, the interaction between the ice and the ocean. Um, and so that's basically telling us the really cold ice shelf water sitting on top, warm salty water sitting on the bottom. And then we can kind of track the vehicle data um, as it swims along and then map it this way. Um, that also helps us figure out topography. So here we're actually coloring the oxygen levels um, in the water column. So all those different colors are different discrete water masses. But you can also see the shape of this track at the bottom. So this is actually when we swam under the Erebus Glacier Tongue. So the glaciers kind of carved out this shape underneath that no one's been able to see. So it's the first ever bathymetry of this area using the vehicle. So we can actually see that it drops about 100 meters over 400 meter um, horizontal pathway. So that's the track that the vehicle actually took diving underneath. So we're about... Um, about two feet or so off of, off of the seafloor during that dive. But it also allows us to do things like characterize the seafloor. So that's the alien from the beginning, right? Our, our crinoid. Uh, turns out these things are very sensitive to light and vibrations and they're in a light-free and vibration-free environment. So when you bring the robot down, they're very excited about it. Um, that was something we learned this season. Um, but there's a whole range of, of possible exploration that can be done. And so this is the seafloor underneath Erebus Glacier Tongue. Um, 
kind of a totally alien world. And so I like to think about what we might eventually be able to do on another planet. But even on our own planet, a lot of this hasn't been explored. And so being able to take data like this, hopefully we can help out other Earth scientists, other biologists, um, on our quest to understand these, these environments much better. Um, so things like, you can see the, the brittle star here. There's sponges in the background. We've seen anemones. There's a shrimp kind of hanging out over here and a sea spider. Um, so we saw all kinds of different uh, things as well as the water column. And so um, future collaborations for this um, we're hoping are going to be um, pretty fun. Um, and uh, I can't give a talk about this without showing this that happened to us. So we're sitting here on the bottom at like 200 meters depth. <laughs> and it just came right up and booped the robot right in the nose. Like, hey, what's going on? Um, it turns out that seal's tagged, actually, too. So it's uh, one of the ones that's being studied. So, um, so it was kind of neat, right? So the experiences you get to have with this as you're trying to do all this new science is also pretty cool. Um, and so this last scene that I'm showing you here is the approach to the glacier tongue itself. So the first, I showed you some data of us actually swimming underneath it and then mapping oxygen and, and salts in the water column. This is us swimming along the ice and running into the, into the iceberg, um, or the, the piece of the glacier tongue that's kind of tearing off. And so images like this, while they're just stunningly beautiful and really cool things that we've never seen before, also help us figure out some of the processes going on, like these kind of cups that are happening from the interaction of the, uh, of the water current on the surface of, of the ice. Uh, there's places where there, it looks like brine has drained down the sides. And so we're able to learn a lot about the system. Um, just using the vehicle. And then as we're doing that, we're teaching the vehicle and teaching ourselves how to run uh, future missions. So hopefully we'll get lots of lessons about how to, how to explore. Um, so what's up next for this project? So one of the things that we're excited about um, is that um, in 2010, there was a, a hole towards the front of the ice shelf, um, and they were actually trying to drill into the seafloor. And so they sent a vehicle down to look at the seafloor and make sure that the drill rig was working OK. And then they turned around to look at the drill rig coming through uh, the ice shelf and were surprised to find these guys. Um, so these are actually anemones growing out of the ice. So they're an inverted benthos. So there's a whole, whole um, host of organisms that have never been seen before that are actually using the ice as an interface. And so these things are actually a few centimeters long, and they're dangling out filter feeding in the open ocean. Um, the little guy down to the right, everyone calls the egg roll, because we've never caught one before, and it looks like an egg roll. Um, but we don't really know anything about this ecosystem. We've only been there once, and it was in 2010. And so we've actually been funded to go back. Um, and as long as uh, NSF um, and NASA and ANZ and a few other people can kind of get our stuff um, all working, we should have a hot water drill and be able to access this site again. So we're hoping to be able to sample these things. Um, we're not stopping there. We're building a water sampler. We're building a cell counter so we can count microbes in the water column. Um, and we're working on microscope as well. Um, so we've got a lot to do. So I always like to bring it back to Galileo because he's my favorite person and who we named the mission after. Um, but really, he did some amazing things. So Galileo used the motion of the moons around Jupiter to prove that the Earth wasn't the center of the universe. And so the way I like to think about it is that I think it would be really cool if we went back to Europa um, and Galileo was right again and kind of proved that we also weren't alone uh, in the universe. Um, so um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop on this gorgeous picture of Europa and uh, take some questions. Thank you.